Wow, hi. <laughs> Welcome to our talk, why Kubernetes can't get around FinOps. I haven't expected so many in-person faces. Um, welcome, good afternoon. Um, my name is Manuela. I'm working for Liquid Reply as a consultant and I'm the number crunching person doing monitoring KPI and so on and so on. This lovely person next to me is my colleague Vanessa um, and she's also a consultant at uh, Liquid Reply and our evangelist about FinOps. But what we actually love about doing FinOps every day is that we have the ability to build and orchestrate high-performing FinOps teams and bringing DevOps people from ugh, about cost management to pretty excitement. But before we dive deeper into the topic, we brought a small riddle for you. Um, this is a cloud bill from a customer. That's from AWS. Oh, sorry, I'm not supposed to walk that way. <laughs> so, okay, and I would kindly uh, like to ask you to um, spot the least efficient application or workload on this cloud bill. Try to. Can you give me a show of hands who is able to do that? I can't see so much, but I see a single hand back there. Let's have a talk later <laughs> because Basically, you um, figured out the first reason why Kubernetes can't get around FinOps. Because this cloud bill is something that your business is getting by the end of the month. And this cloud bill is no longer sufficient when, it's, when it comes to allocating costs to your workloads and projects. In fact, the latest survey of the CNCF shows that around 70% of the companies fairly estimate or don't monitor at all cost with Kubernetes. And basically that's the reason why we're here today. So what we want to do is give you a short glimpse about, again, why Kubernetes can't get around FinOps and show a bit, based on our experience, how to gain cost transparency and control and what you, everyone in this room, can do in their daily practice to support FinOps practice. So, some of you might remember these ancient previous pre-cloud days where you had to go to your project manager or whatever manager um, to ask for resources to get your server approved, the one that you really need to get your project up and running. And in these ancient times, the managers were actually the people producing, managing and approving the costs. But as we all know, that changed with the cloud. Now you have us engineers producing the costs, so you have a lot more people than before producing costs just by the push of a button. But still at the same time, you have the old traditional processes that apply. You have the same people like before, the managers, finance, whatever roles they're called, and they still have to somehow manage the budget and they still kind of want to approve the costs and the budget to being able to govern them and, and manage it. But so, I mean, it would be easy to just update these processes and um, based on the variable cloud cost model. But I mean, to be honest, the, uh, the business and the finance people, they don't really understand how the cloud works most of the time. <laughs> um, and now Kubernetes comes in and that's a whole new abstraction layer on top of the cloud. And that creates that huge knowledge gap between the technical and the non-technical people. Because how should they ever comprehend how Kubernetes and Kubernetes costs work when they can't even comprehend the variable cost model of the cloud? And so that's exactly what FinOps addresses. Because at the end of the day, we need the buy-in of those non-technical people um, because, well, they have to plan the budget somehow, and we engineers don't want to do that. At least I don't. <laughs> so FinOps, or you might remember the DevOps movement, or like pre-DevOps, there were like developers and operations people, and they didn't talk to each other, and it was a huge mess. So like every team was annoyed by the other team, and it wasn't fun. 
then DevOps came, brought these two teams together, suddenly you had one team, and it worked pretty well. And now today, you have a similar situation. You have DevOps teams, and you have the finance and business people. And now you have to bring them ag again together to have a FinOps team. And FinOps does that, um, and at the end of the day, it enables all of these people, when they begin to talk to each other again, to um, make these spending decisions, the decisions the company needs, you as an engineer need, to being finally able to work on some cool features. And at the end of the day, it increases the business value of the cloud, of Kubernetes, for the whole company. But to start with that, you as an engineer really need to get into the head of the finance and business people. And that's where you need to know, or at least be able to ask the questions that they ask. They want to know what are the top spending drivers, so what's the project with the highest expenses, um, so how efficient or inefficient is a cluster or a, an environment, or in general, who uses what, when, and what's happening. <laughs> and that's the whole um, topic of, of transparency. And once you're able to answer those questions, you can then go into that purple question and ask about where can we start optimizing. And that's exactly, and um, when you have to answer to that purple question, you can finally free up money, and that money could be well spent on other innovative features, or maybe a new work colleague, um, and finally you can have like a not 80 hours work week or something. Or you can finally buy some beer for your whole team. Thank you. <laughs> um, well, basically, it is all about how to gain transparency um, when it comes to uh, Kubernetes and cloud cost management to then have control about these costs. And there are many different ways to get there, but um, the main strategies here to gain um, cost transparency are monitoring and labeling. And on the other side, to gain bad control, right sizing and waste management. But let's dive a little bit deeper into that. So first of all, before anyone says anything about monitoring, this is not about solely performance. I'm pretty sure every one of you has at least one or many, several tools to monitor their clusters, their nodes, their workloads whatsoever. The trick here is this is solely focusing on performance. When it comes to FinOps, every monitoring you have to do has to have the ability to link this to cost metrics. So first of all, this is a different data source. So usually it's your cloud provider's bill, it's the agreed discounts, it's the reservations you made, it's about um, scenario building, how much would something cost when I do it on demand? How much would I, if I, if I were talking about AWS, the savings plan? Um, your monitoring should be able to link those metrics because then you can measure not only the efficiency but can tell how much it costs. This brings you one step closer to transparency. Now that we can see costs, basically we have a second problem. How many workloads are running approximately on your nodes and clusters? I bet a lot, and that's the issue. Remember the cloud bill from the beginning? I could totally say how much I spend for an S3 bucket based on that list, and I totally could tell you how much I would have to pay for an EC2 instance, but that still doesn't give me the ability to tell or to answer the questions Vanessa just introduced. I can't tell how much a project spent. I can't tell how much an environment spent. I can't compare them to each other. So labeling is the key to this. These three things you can see on the screen right now are basically not new to you, but in the context of our daily work, I want to outline them. Why? The first thing about the pot template, I had to learn by heart. Um, if you don't label at the right spot in your configuration template, you cannot monitor costs. I did it wrong when I did it the first time, and I labeled the deployment. Yes, that was a very stupid moment, 
but um, we had to do it all over again. And we had written policies and everything, so it's chaos. So um, I want to outline that, don't repeat that mistake. The second thing is, when it comes to labeling, um, your key value pairs have to be targeting cost management. So about your keys, what you can see at the slide right now, these are the ones the community of FinOps has come up with as being the most common ones. Obviously, you can individualize them for your organization, but to answer the questions we, we saw in the beginning, it's application, business unit, company, cost center, environment, and project that should be outlined when it comes to cost transparency. And one last important thing about the value description Cost monitoring and cost reporting that comes out of the cost monitoring is for non-technical people. So you have to keep in mind when writing your values that they are understandable, comprehensible for non-technical people. Because even if you set up the perfect labeling and you have it with policies and everything running, if no one else, despite you, understands it, then you have the same issue with you're the only one knowing what runs on your clusters. So now you gained cost transparency. So basically I can tell you now what your environment is producing in costs. But this knowledge is nothing without knowing how to optimize. Optimizing, that's the purple question, the one from before. And it starts by right sizing. So right sizing is all about setting the right amount of CPU or memory or the right amount of resources of your cluster, of your nodes, of your workloads. And it starts, and that's actually that's the essential part of right sizing. Um, it starts by setting resource requests and limits. Per default, Kubernetes doesn't set any resource limits to your pods. So that means like your pod can consume whatever amount of resources it wants. So that means that it's our tasks, uh, task to set the resource requests and limits to our pods and to all of them. It's not enough to just put it on one of the pods. And then we can automate the whole autoscaling magic. And we have three autoscalers that I'm going to talk about. And the first one is in a, for a stateful workload. So when your workload just needs a little bit of more resources for a limited amount of time. As a lazy engineer, you could just say, okay, I set those resource requests a bit higher than my pod actually needs it. But I mean, again, that's just a waste of resources. So don't do that. <laughs> On the other hand, you have those engineers that are like the money-saving foxes. They just set the right amount of resources that the pod needs but then you probably run into performance issues in the worst case. And the vertical pod autoscaler addresses exactly that issue and it automizes it. So the VPA monitors the actual usage of your pod and suggests new values for the resource requests um, if the pod needs it. And there is even one configuration where it applies those suggested values right at the pod, to the pod, and it gets redeployed, and that's like the automatically happening. That's for stateful workloads, but of course we have also stateless workloads. And that's where the horizontal pod autoscaler is for. This one, again, uh, monitors the actual usage of the pods and adds or removes pods based on yeah, the target value, the target CPU or memory you're defining in the autoscaler. That was it on a pod, on a workload level. Then we have the other level of the infrastructure level. So that means nodes. The cluster autoscaler does a similar thing um, to the horizontal pod autoscaler before, to be honest, because it just adds nodes or removes them. But this one, it's not based on the actual usage. It just, it's based on um, the scheduling status of your pods. So if the cluster autoscaler sees, okay, it's not possible to schedule a pod due to resource constraints on your node, then it brings up a new node. Fourth point is eliminating waste. 
you might say, okay, yeah, autoscaler are exactly doing that, and yes, you're right, but there is more to it. You could add, for example, policies um, that shut down environments when you don't need them. For example, a dev environment or a test environment. You could set a policy to shut it down, like those non-critical non workloads, actually, over the weekend or during off hours. Now, some of you might say, okay, yeah, my dev environment, it's just $50, who cares? Um, take a look at the picture at the bottom of the slide. You see all those colorful bars. And every single one of them is one engineer saying, okay, it's just $50. So at the end of the day, it's all about the sum of the cost it produces. And actually, that's a good reference to the monitoring Manuela said earlier, because with cost monitoring, you have or you get back the overall view of the things, and you're not blindsided by your own project. Yes, thank you. So how to implement uh, FinOps practice in your daily work? I want to refer to the last slide first. You saw those bars. So I think the first thing you should know about FinOps is it's getting out of the bubble and seeing the big picture. Because in fact, when you're working for, for an organization, when you're working for a company, you're not the only account. You're not the only developer. You're not the only project. And yes, if you have resources over provisioned or if you have um, systems running on the weekends, your single account doesn't do any harm. But make the math. Like, do this with 200 accounts. Do this four weekends per month. Do this 12 months a year. This is like a lot of money you're wasting without any necessity. So I want to highlight that common understanding across roles. That's the first thing about FinOps in general, to understand why it's important. And then it's not about like cutting costs like just generally. And when it comes to monitoring and labeling, I want to highlight this one. Because, again, if you create labels in your bubble, and maybe across your team, that still doesn't make sure that A, business and finance can use these labels for reports and stuff, and B, that another team is doing the exact same thing. So, like with everything on the technical side you're doing, it's the same with those things. You have to agree and collaborate, working together on a standardized list, and then you have to make it part of your processes and documentation. The second thing, and this is an, a nice example, <laughs> when it comes to naming conventions, and I know I oot some of you now, um, <laughs> when it comes to naming conventions, there are two important things to know about clusters, Whatever monitoring tool you're, you're using, since they are also for non-technical people, they are using names. So whenever you are using the same name for two different things, this can create confusion. As you can see in this example behind me, that happened when we were monitoring what we thought was one cluster. But by the end of the month, surprise, doubled the cost, were actually two clusters. Again, this is not only your team or your project, this is across organization and project standards. The second thing, and this is the other way around, is with labels. I know it's a very tiring topic, but it's very important to, to have a standardized um, spelling, how you do things. When I first started with my actual, like, recent client project, we had monitoring based on tags, and I had, I think, a seven or eight different spells for environment. Just for the key, not the, not the value, just for the key. So here it's very <laughs> important again that you um, manage to come up with a standard, agree on it, put it in your documentation. The second thing, and this is something again someone from finance and management can't do, is ensure functional monitoring and labeling. What does that mean? It's a procedural change. So whenever you create something new, you have to make sure that it's part of the monitoring. And this is your job. No one can take this away. And the second thing comes with the labels as well. 
whenever you're doing something new, you have to make sure that it's part of the monitoring and labeling team thing. This is how you can ensure from a technical side and help provide information. No one is expecting that you do the math, that you do the reportings, but this is necessary so someone else can do. A few tips for right sizing. So yesterday at our booth we had a visitor and we were discussing autoscalers. And he was like, okay, that's kindergarten autoscalers. Everyone knows that. Then we were talking about, okay, how do you set your resource request? Do you even do that? I was like, yeah, of course I do, and no autoscaling. And then we were, we were like, okay, but how? What's the metric? How, how much CPU or memory do you set? I was like, okay, I do it, to be honest, gut feeling. Okay, yeah, fine, I mean, you're the engineer, maybe you have a good gut feeling. But then he was like, okay, but usually I just add like, 10% to my gut feeling just to be safe. And now imagine you add 10% to everything, to each and every single one of your pots, and suddenly you have a huge overhead again, and that's just a waste of resources. So when setting resource requests, initially, please do load tests or some kind of similar thing to load tests. Um, and over time, you can, of course, improve those limits. Of course, you can always start by doing that plus 10%, but pre please improve it over time. And monitoring helps you doing that, and you can just iterate over the resource requests, and it will get better. Talking about autoscalers, it's a really cool thing, and you can even combine the horizontal and the vertical pod autoscalers. But the thing is, both of them act on the same metrics. So both of them could uh, measure CPU or memory. And so that's the issue when you configure both of them to actually monitor the same metric, then you will create a race condition and that will not work. Third point, a short reminder. Use the vertical pod autoscaler for state full workloads and the horizontal pod autoscaler for state less workloads. And last but not least, a short story of one of my projects. So I had a project with amazing genius engineers, as we all are, and they set the perfect amount or the perfect configuration of autoscalers as well as the perfect configuration for weekend shutdown policies. Then the weekend came, the policy applied, the clusters went down, the autoscalers spent them back up, the integrated monitoring systems were blinking, and the operations team was awake. And that happened a few times during the night, and it wasn't a very good night, at least for the operations team. And so when using policies and autoscalers, make sure they work together, they're integrated well into each other, and make sure that the surrounding systems don't blink and alert everyone involved. I remember that incident, by the way. I was nasty. Um, <laughs> let's wrap it up. Um, this was really just a very short glimpse into the world of FinOps. Um, but the key message is that it's not about cutting costs. It's about enabling data-driven decisions to then be able to save costs. Yes, that's a part of it. Um, monitoring, labeling, right-sizing, waste management, these are the key things to get there. Obviously, we have so many more things to do, but the key things are this. And what the best takeaway I would invite you all to, to, to take with you uh, today is that the first step for the daily practice is acknowledgement. Basically knowing that this is a necessity with every abstraction level we are creating from a technical side. And then to make sure from a technical setup that you help the people who needs to understand them on a second place. Well, so this was it. We are very happy to be here today and uh, we invite you to come to our booth uh, in Pavillon 2 at SU32. But are there any questions yet?
have a microphone over there, uh, maybe. Um, I can. Neben dir? So, I think there this lady was first. <laughs> Thank you. There's a lot of correlation between cutting cloud costs, et cetera, and the environmental impact. Is there a link between FinOps and I don't know what the next portmanteau green ops is? Yes, definitely. <laughs> yes. <laughs> That's actually one of uh, my, my passion topics right now. Thanks for the question. Um, yes, there is a correlation, but of course, if you reduce costs, if you, for example, right size your instances, then, of course, you save CO2. But it's not like FinOps, all of FinOps is green ops because you have things like um, discounts, for example, pricing discounts, and you get them without right sizing anything. So that doesn't have an uh, impact on the CO2 as far as I know. Um, but of course, yes, there are a lot of, there is a lot of correlation between these two. I think back there is another microphone, right? It's like, thank you so much. Are we working? Yeah. Uh, first off, thank you ever so much. This has been really timely uh, for the problems I'm going through at work at the moment. So I will definitely come over and talk to you at the booth. Yes, the thing I really wanted to ask about was um, the visualization aspects. Um, I appreciate there's probably quite a few tools out there, but how you get to a position where you can actually create these reports that go out to your finance teams in a format that's actually consumable by them. And then a second question, which is around the budgeting and the operationalization, because we work in an environment where our finance team are quite a long way from us, mm -hmm. um, and how we go about doing things like budgeting and, and financial preparation, because we work on an annual cycle. Anyway, just that those two questions, thank you. Thank you very much for the question. And I have so many answers to that, but I tried to summarize them to two main things. Um, so the very first thing is that um, every monitoring tool you're, you're choosing, whatever it is, has different functions based on your environment. Um, we are, for example, working with tools like Laudability. We are working with tools like Qcost and Cloud Health and you name them. We met a few here. Um, the tricky part, and this is where, um, where it's getting interesting, um, is to understand how your operation works. With the client right now I'm working, we implemented the tool, but we came up with, a, with certain individual thresholds to define, okay, when get projects alerted? When are they um, getting recommendations? What's the amount of money w where it's worth it to actually get to people? And then we um, started creating reports first manually, then automize them. Now they get the frequent um, you know, feedback automated by the tool. And uh, we have work groups that come together and now working through those recommendations. So this was a procedural change management coming with the tool. And the second thing, um, as I initially said, um, our main job is bringing exactly those departments together. So the projects we are working in we always have the setup, finance is there, business is there, IT is somewhere, everywhere. And the main thing is you have to f find allies. You have to find people who are willing to work on that, bring them to a table, come up with a strategy. But I, we can talk into detail. Are there any more questions? Well, ah, there. Um, Hi. Hi, Second. hello. Ah, yeah. Ah, there. Yeah, it was, there was also someone, and the, the microphone here is missing. Ah. <laughs> OK, it's here. <laughs> I guess okay. I'll go first. Uh, hi, hello. Thank you for the presentation. Very interesting. Uh, very good points. I was wondering, do you have any advice regarding right sizing? Uh, maybe uh, regarding load tests, uh, if you found some particularly useful tools for doing that? Um, well, the first advice I can give you is talk to your um, talk to your using teams. It sounds it sounds stupid, but if they know how a similar application is like live used, they can give you numbers to actually do workloads because they have the market experience, the the productive experience, and then you bring them back into the teams. 
Um, and I would say we don't have a number because it really differs from project to environment. But I think the advice I could give you is try to even standardize that. If you don't have any market response, try to think of scenarios that could happen. I don't know if you're talking about a basic example, online shop, you have to be scalable and you have to test that, what happens with your, with your workload when you put traffic on it a lot. And the second thing is that you should use the same test parameters across the team. I think that's, that's the advice I could give you, like from scratch without knowing anything about your project. Okay. Thank you, by the way. The, uh, the, the lovely person running around with a microphone is one of our colleagues. And <laughs> Uh, yeah, uh, so I was wondering, you were putting an emphasis on the uh, labels yes. before, but it's, it, it, so you said that the labels that were there were kind of like found out by, by, by you to be the best, but is this coming from some kind of standard uh, from the financial, fi sorry, financial applications? Or, oh, thank you. <laughs> <laughs> thank you again. <laughs> uh, <laughs> Or is, or is that defined per, per organization like freely or is already some kind of standard in the industry for labeling things in uh, Kubernetes? So, Thanks. Thank you for this question. Um, FinOps is based on the community work. The FinOps Foundation is part of the CNCF. So everything we do, we do in kind of a collaboration and in, in, in exchange. And what we presented to you are the results of like a lot of people around the globe talking about and figuring out what. Um, there is no standard yet in certain things because we're doing, like we're still exploring this fairly new topic, but these are the ones that are like overlapping with whomever you're talking. So this is kind of the best practice we figured. <laughs> Okay, well, I think, there ah, one there's one, I'm sorry. <laughs> Hi, thank Hi. you. Um, I wanted to ask you mainly regarding labeling. If you had any issue with partners, especially with uh, fast changing teams, mm -hmm. something, if you had any experience with fast changing teams and labeling in the part where, I don't know, a team changes the name, how do people set them their labels, Perhaps one uses an underscore, perhaps one uses a different mm -hmm. convention. So how do you get around perhaps that issue? Um, three things about that. The first thing is, as I said, the agreed standard. So when we did this in my recent client project, we um, sat together and we had a look of how they, uh, the projects do that in general. Like do they Pascal or whatever kind of um, uh, label usage? And based on that, we developed the labels, we agreed on them, and we sent them out to all the projects. And we said like, okay, listen, you have like a saying, you have like, I don't know, two days or whatsoever to give feedback if you're okay with that or not. And then we, th this was kind of agreed since we took everyone on board. And then we have this list documented. It's like part of documentation for deployment in every single project. So it's, it's agreed standard. And uh, what we are working uh, on right now is uh, policies that enforce that with every resource deploy. So basically using the same labels we defined manually um, and then put them into policies. But there are also tools um, that can add virtual tags. They're like different ones. It's always a bit depends on how, how big your environment is and how many projects you have plus um, how much money you want to spend. <laughs> Any more questions? Thank you very much Thanks. for your time.